Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to uh, week four. And I'm going to begin uh, taping the uh, next three lectures. Uh, this one will be uh, discerning worldviews in a pluralistic society. And I've divided them up into three parts. So this will be the first part, and basically about 15 slides uh, each. So uh, we'll get started on that, but remember to uh, keep up with your assignments and your discussion board uh, so you don't get uh, behind. Let me share the screen with you and we'll get started here. All right. So uh, discerning worldviews in a pluralistic society, we've uh, only kind of touched on worldviews at this point, but pointing out that we're talking about a biblical uh, worldview. And, uh, and in this session, we'll get deeper into what worldviews are. And we'll even do some uh, things that help us to distinguish the course perceptions in conceptualizing worldview distance, uh, like someone from a different culture has a, a different worldview, there's a, there's a conceptual di difference between their understanding of the world and our understanding of the world. We'll discuss some of the things that make that up. All right, so um, let's get started here. So uh, some objectives, first of all, in studying worldview. Uh, first of all, it helps us to discern our own worldview, uh, which means we're, we're able to articulate uh, our view of the world, why we see the world the way we do. Second, uh, it celebrates uh, God who created all this diversity in the world and, uh, you know, even at Book of Revelation, it points out that uh, in, uh, with, when people are present with God, there's people from every nation, every tribe, uh, diversity again. Uh, this also decreases uh, cultural myopia. In other words, it's, we, we're not just confined in our thinking to our own cultural norms and experience, but we try to break out of that and understand other people's worldview. And thus, by doing that, we understand their, uh, more of their cultural perspective. Uh, four, increase our abilities to dialogue with people. When we know uh, our own worldview, we all, and we realize that uh, people have different worldviews, and we're able to uh, understand those a, a little bit better through various conceptual things we'll go through today and the next uh, couple of sessions. Uh, it helps our ability to dialogue and it, in so doing improve our abilities to communicate the gospel as Christians who hold a Christian worldview that is one of those things that's very important to us. And then uh, finally facilitate bridge building between people, uh, whether you're sharing the gospel or just getting to know people and working with people, it does facilitate uh, building uh, bridges between people. When people realize that you're trying to understand them and where they come from and their background, uh, you know, they, uh, that is a way of building bridges between people. Uh, as the Bible uh, kind of paraphrasing something the Bible says, so we live, we're living as ambassadors for the kingdom by entering into the, to others' lives who are also created in the image of God uh, for whom God in the flesh lived and died. And so uh, uh, these are some of the objectives of studying worldviews. Uh, it's a important subject and we have to understand what, what we're talking about when we're talking about worldview. Uh, I'm gonna give you three definitions uh, out of the three. I like the top one, uh, but it's the most difficult because it's longest to remember. Uh, any of these three will be fine for an exam uh, but we will spend more time with the first one, which is worldview is a fundamental, cognitive, effective, and evaluative assumptions a group of people make about the nature of things and uh, by which they order their lives. And so uh, the reason I like this one is because it has cognitive, effective, and evaluative assumptions, which 
uh, is what's going on in our thinking uh, aspects, different aspects of our thinking. Uh, but if you want to simplify it, worldviews are how people perceive and interpret reality, which they use for living. Or as James Sire, who has written quite a bit uh, from a philosophical perspective on worldview, a set of presuppositions which we hold about the makeup of the world. What I don't like about that one is it, it leaves out for which by which we use for living, uh, which I think should be added. Uh, if you want a uh, another perspective on biblical worldview, uh, this fellow here, this link, what takes you to a, a guy who talks about a biblical worldview. It's very useful. I will post it with this uh, lecture so that you can listen to it. Uh, and he, he will add uh, some things about uh, worldviews, uh, that uh, biblical worldview that are important. Well, those are definitions, uh, and uh, we'll continue to work with this top one as we go through uh, this presentation. Another way of looking at worldviews, this is a very common way. Uh, the worldview is sort of at the core of our thinking. Uh, it's those presuppositions. We just have an understanding that's in our minds about this world, whether we think it's an open worldview where there's a spiritual dimension and God or a closed worldview where all we're thinking is in terms we make all our judgments in terms of it's all material world, whatever that might be, or some other religious idea or concepts. And so if you work your way outward from the worldview, uh, the question is, what is the world? And so that's your perception of the world down here. And then, so out of that, what is the world? What's true in the world? What, uh, what's true as compared to what's false? And this is your beliefs. And how do you decide what's true? And uh, this comes to some kind of belief in something that uh, dictates that. And then what is good? This is your values. How do you determine what is good, what is wrong, right? Uh, things like that. Or if you think about things like the uh, effective side, which we'll talk about in a minute, is, you know, what's beautiful, what you consider beautiful, uh, so forth. Uh, so, um, but what is good, you know, values, and then what do we do? Uh, you know, this is your behavior, and we'll see more about this as we go on, but this is one way that's commonly used to describe worldview. So, uh, worldview and religion are terms uh, that are closely related, but not synonymous. Every relig religion can be called a worldview, uh, but not all worldviews are religious. And, but that partly depends on how you define religion. Uh, but as we have defined it in this course, uh, that would be the case. Uh, for example, the main world religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam are worldviews and religions. They give a perspective of the world, but they also classed as uh, world religions. Now, secular humanism, uh, by our definition in this class, is not a religion, but it is a worldview. It is a way of perceiving reality and having presuppositions about reality. Uh, yeah, but if you were to go to our court system, the courts in the U.S. have uh, made it clear that they that secular humanism can be considered a uh, religion, and uh, but there are, uh, there are issues with that in the sense that our, by our definition, being religious, you have to have some kind of belief in something transcendent, which secular humanism does not, and we'll note this in a minute. You see, there's a link to a video, uh, James Anderson. What is your worldview? It's a good, uh, good presentation by him. I have this also in your uh, on Canvas, where if you watch it and do the assignment with it, then it can be for extra credit as well. But it is also goes with this lecture in our discussion of worldviews, and he adds uh, some interesting thoughts uh, to our uh, discussion. So feel free to do that. I will connect it into uh, this uh, uh, presentation. It'll be there like uh, on the other weeks that when we have some. 
All right, uh, definition of a religion, and we noted this earlier. So this is just kind of a reminder. A religion is a system of beliefs and practices that provide values by means of its cultus, which directs a person toward transcendence and thus provides meaning and coherence to a person's life. And uh, this is uh, adapted from uh, uh, Winfred uh, Corderon, uh, book, The Neighboring Faith. So given that uh, definition uh, of it, now, cultus is just a, a literary term for rites and rituals practiced in worship, uh, generally. And um, so that's what he means by that. And secular humanism, by this definition, isn't, uh, isn't uh, a religion because it lacks the cultus, uh, but it also does not direct a person toward the transcendent uh, uh, because the physical world is the only reality. And so that's uh, a big difference. So let's talk about worldview and culture uh, because you have worldview uh, and you have religion, but you also have culture and we've defined culture uh, previously, so, but we don't want to confuse the two. Now remember the worldview is a set of presuppositions about the makeup of one's world. So that's your worldview, how a person perceives and interprets reality, which they here use for living uh, which this, how they use it for living, is what designs culture. Culture is an integrated system of learned patterns of ideas, values, behavior, and products to meet the needs of its members. So a uh, group of people and individuals, they have a presuppositions about the makeup of the world. And uh, from that, uh, they, they develop this culture in which they live. And, uh, and they develop an integrated system of learned patterns of ideas. They take these ideas, these presuppositions, and out of those come the ideas and values, behaviors, and then produce products uh, to be used uh, by those members. Uh, so, but, so culture is learned system based on one's worldview. Another way of uh, understanding worldviews is uh, this iceberg uh, illustration. And uh, this, uh, this is a photo I got off of the internet. And if you're wondering you know, how that guy ever got that picture, uh, don't because uh, it is a Photoshop picture. Uh, somebody took a iceberg uh, and put the top of it up here. And then down here, they Photoshopped in under the water, another iceberg, uh, just upside down. And so that's how, but it illustrates the point of an iceberg because 80% uh, of an iceberg is usually under water. Uh, only about 20% or so is a see, a seeable above the water. So it, it works as an illustration for what we're talking about here. Uh, when we, the top of the iceberg really is, the patterns of behavior. This is what we can see in, in people's lives and in cultures uh, just that are easier to see. And uh, that is the products, the things that are produced. Now they do come from ideas and thoughts and uh, from our values and beliefs, but we can't see those, but we can see the products. What does it produce? You know, for example, our values, it produces a certain type of behavior. It can be bad behavior, good behavior, uh, or whatever, it can produce goods. You know, we've built incredibly big cities with uh, big, tall skyscrapers, uh, amazing things, bridges. We don't see animals building these, even as smart as some monkeys and apes are, they, they don't do that. Uh, so there's something special about humans. Uh, uh, in the above the water is also the myths and rites. By myths is generally meaning the writings associated with the religion uh, and uh, rites, uh, religious ceremonies and things like that. Those can be seen and uh, they are based on people's beliefs, but you can't, again, you can't see the beliefs, but you can see the outcome of those beliefs as they're acted out uh, in various ways. 
And then uh, actions and rituals, things that are rituals or things that are repeated. They can be in uh, religious ceremonies, but you, know, you also have rituals in the morning. Maybe you put your left sock on first in the morning, and then you're right. Uh, those can be perceived, uh, although they may not be very meaningful to most people, but it is seeable. Actions, in other words, uh, out of your beliefs come, uh, come this and out of your values. And that's the second layer, which is not seeable. Uh, below, just below the water is the belief system. Uh, you can have deep beliefs of various kinds and based on those beliefs, uh, they will dictate what happens above the water and uh, the values that come from those beliefs. Uh, what, what do you consider right? What do you consider wrong? How do you consider right? How do you consider it wrong? Uh, those values uh, will manifest themselves in various ways uh, from our worldview. And the deepest level, and that's those presuppositions on which our beliefs and values also are built, but also uh, it undergirds the patterns of behavior. That's our worldview. And uh, the worldview consists of a lot of different things, uh, our presuppositions. And in other words, there's themes, and we'll talk about what those themes are. There's epistemology. How do we know what we know or how you know how do we think about how we know and logics how we how we think about things uh, how our pattern of thinking is and we'll we'll do a little exercise which shows that our pattern of thinking is a very much influenced by our culture uh, which again in turn we, it comes back to uh, influencing our presuppositions uh, category formation, how, what do we put in certain categories? Uh, and uh, so there's a, a lot that goes in the worldview. And since uh, this is not a specific class on worldview, we won't go totally in depth in all of those, but we'll get some you know, feeling for those. But those are the deepest level of our thinking and they kind of undergird uh, everything else. All right, uh, so those themes we talked about just a second ago as part of worldview. So we'll talk about those uh, six themes and uh, kind of give you an example of uh, some of those. First uh, theme is time. Every culture, er every perception of the world, every worldview has a sense of time. And uh, we in the US, uh, we tend to be linear in our thinking. And in other words, saying, well, there's going to, there's a beginning and an end. Even uh, in uh, biblical history, time is seen as linear. There was a beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, there was a beginning, but there will be a time when Jesus returns that there will be an end. So there's that linear view. In the US, even if you're not a Christian, generally a linear view of time, uh, even if you're a secular, Humanists don't believe in the spiritual realm at all. You tend to think, well, there was a big bang or a series of big bangs, things began. And uh, these days, a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe we're going to get hit by a comet or something that's going to bring the end, or eventually this whole system is going to run down. Uh, but there are other types of uh, world uh, time understandings. For example, Hinduism, Buddhism, it's a cyclical, it uh, repeats a cycle of reincarnation. Uh, and uh, and so they don't they don't view time in the same way as uh, we do in the West. And there's others, but uh, like pendulum and dream. But we're, uh, those are you know s smaller groups of people who have those views. Uh, space. How people uh, view uh, space. Uh, we have people have maps of the universe and the world around them, uh, and. Uh, they view spaces differently. You can see this illustrated with, you know, uh, our own personal space here in the U.S. Before COVID, anyway, uh, you know, our personal space was about arm's length. Now we six feet is what we want with COVID. Uh, but uh, we have our own personal space. Uh, how we survey things for space is uh, varies. How we set up our households. It's based on space and some uh, belief systems and worldviews 
they want to face the doors a certain way. They have their space in their house made a certain way uh, that's important. And so uh, uh, people have different views of space. Now, uh, you know, as an American, being arm's length is, at best is the closest you really want uh, people to be. Uh, but in some cultures, being right up here in front of you like that, where I worked in Kenya, my wife and I, we, you know, people, when, when they wanted to talk, they got right here. That was their norm. And I'd see uh, people uh, uh, from visiting from the U.S. talking with some people there, and uh, the people get up to talk to them, and the poor Americans just moving backwards until he's stuck in a corner. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just, he was trying to get in the comfort zone for talking to the American, and the American was trying to get moved back out to get into his comfort zone. Uh, but there's different views of space. Uh, cosmic realities, uh, you know, what are those things above ourselves? You know, generally, you know, in the U.S., uh, this is still the vast majority of people believe in God in some form. Uh, and they may believe in other cosmic gods. As Christians, we know there are angels and cherubim, seraphims, uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, others have other ideas of cosmic realities as well. And if it's a different religion, they may have other uh, cosmic realities involved. So something beyond themselves. Uh, self and other, what it means to be human. Uh, you know, as Christians, we believe all people are created in the image of God, and so of equal value in God's sight. However, uh, there are cultures in which, uh, the, the, by their own worldview, uh, they see themselves as superior, and sometimes they look at other people as inferior in one form or another. And this happens in modern society, too. Uh, I mean, go back to World War II. You know, and the worldview uh, for Nazi Germany uh, was that we're the superior race and uh, the Jews are not. And uh, uh, so they, they began to exterminate them and along with others. They weren't the only ones, six million Jews, but there were another three million of other folks of ethnic, different ethnic backgrounds or just politically uh, incorrect with uh, the Nazism. Uh, but uh, you can have that in modern society of others as not worthy or not as worth as much as, uh, as themselves. And oh, that can happen individually. So we need to be very careful about that. Uh, there's a notion, uh, notions of causality. What causes things? For example, what causes death? Is it caused by a disease or is it caused by evil spirits? In some cultures, uh, if something happens to a young person, they might immediately think, oh, that was because of some evil spirit or some voodoo curse or something like that it can be quite common in some cultures. Uh, but uh, you know, in the U.S. culture, we think more in terms of natural causes uh, and uh, things from uh, viruses to bacteria uh, to things like that. But all cultures have some presuppositions about that, that aspect of the world they live in. The universal human experience, all cultures experience birth, death, sex, childhood, adulthood, age, and they have ways of organizing that, putting them in categories. Uh, and uh, um, those transitions in life uh, are sometimes marked very specifically in subcultures, less so in other cultures. Uh, sort of like going from childhood to adulthood. The culture we worked in in Kenya, there's a very prescribed method of going through to, that moved you from uh, childhood to adulthood. And it was a circumcision ceremony for both men and women. And uh, to go through that, and then when you were done and you did it right, you came out on the other side, you were a, now a, an adult now in the US. We have a hard time with that because uh, we don't have a really prescribed time. Some say, well, when you're able to get your driver's license, that's going from childhood to adulthood. Some even say, oh, when you're, you know, you have the, you're 21 and you could drink uh, is uh, some people's idea. But, uh, you know, we just don't have a prescribed way of defining it where some cultures are very specific. 
but the, it is a universal human experience, these aspects of life. So they, these are the six universal themes uh, that make up. So they're all up in there in our minds in these presuppositions about what we think of this world we live in. I'll give you an example of time. Uh, this uh, is an interesting one. Um, American view versus a traditional Arab uh, view. And uh, when we say we make an appointment with somebody, we're going to say, I'm going to, uh, you know, make an appointment, let's say, with a man and a man from an Arab background, uh, the Middle Eastern background. Uh, and uh, you say, well, uh, let's have lunch. So you suppose it's a business meeting, your peers uh, in business. And, uh, he, and he says, yeah, let's, uh, let's eat lunch at 12 o'clock noon. And uh, the American says, yes. And the, uh, the man from the Middle East says, yes, uh, at 12 o'clock it is. Now in the US, if you uh, make that kind of meeting and you, you, know, you wanna show up on time, right? So uh, that would be good, but sometimes you're late. So if you're, you know, you can be five minutes late and people don't think much about it. But if you're later than five minutes, up to 15 minutes, you know, you, you gotta be apologizing saying, oh, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, uh, you know, I got delayed, uh, you know, uh, but you apologize. And if you're late in 15 minutes, you gotta have a pretty good excuse. And so if, if you're late in 30 minutes, the person's probably already gone in the US. They're not gonna wait around. Um, unless they're getting a good meal out of it, I guess. Uh, but if you're more than 30 minutes late, up to say an hour late or later, that's just unforgivably late. You just, you know, you might as well give up on that meeting. And uh, unless you're really close friends, you might not. But now on the other hand, in from traditional Arab, uh, Middle Eastern perspective, um, when they make a time like 12 o'clock and you are a peer and uh, of equal standing, uh, you know, you will not arrive at one o'clock, uh, at 12 o'clock, you will arrive at one o'clock. Now you say, but you made the appointment at 12. I know, but to Americans, we make, it doesn't make sense. But from uh, the uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries perspective, that is the time that you frame you look in to arrive at one would be normal. And uh, arrive early just is strange. Why would you do that? Uh, now, if on the other hand you were a servant, and the guy and your the guy that you were working for says you arrive at twelve o'clock, you better arrive pretty close to twelve o'clock. But for peers, it's the other way. That's just a cultural difference, and they view time in a different way than uh, we do in the U.S. So that's just an example for you. Um, so when we think of worldviews. Worldviews have cultural and social functions. Uh, they're very important to how we function as a society, as a culture. And uh, so uh, I've listed here seven of uh, their cultural and social functions. And these are important. And no doubt you may see these appear on the exam. You know, you'll have to be familiar with them to some degree. And uh, so uh, first of all, the worldviews provide a cognitive foundation on which people build their beliefs of their systems of explanation. So um, it's our cognitive foundation. And from that thinking, we build our systems of how do we explain reality around us? Uh, how do we understand it? Uh, you know, is the desk I'm currently sitting at really there or am I, is it just a structure? A construct of my mind. And believe it or not, this is a common worldview, uh, much more than you might think. Uh, so, but it does uh, form the cognitive foundation for uh, systems of explanation. Supplies are rationale for belief systems. So uh, our presuppositions or worldviews, uh, they give us the rationale for what we believe. Third, gives people emotional security. Uh, we'd, we like to th think of our world in a, a sense of, you know, what we know about it, you know, is secure. 
And uh, so, and it is uh, uh, for the most part in the sense that we can depend on it to act fairly much like it should in its ultimate sense now in the daily grind of cultures and what's going on and when things go bad, uh, you, like maybe a hurricane hits your area or a tornado, uh, or like just recently in Haiti, they had another earthquake, um, you know, that disrupts everything. But this one is talking about your deep uh, belief sy systems. And so it gives you emotional security to know that there's some aspect of reality that's uh, real. Uh, then validates our deepest cultural norms. And so our culture is built on these presuppositions. So our cultural norms, but sometimes our cultural norms are challenged. And, uh, and, and usually they make us uncomfortable because it goes back to our worldview. And uh, there are currently in the US, there are things that are uh, challenging some of our cultural norms. Uh, you know, for as far back in the US as uh, our history goes, you know, uh, marriage was thought of as a, a, a something that is done between a man and a woman, but now being defined and uh, allowable by our courts uh, to, you know, say, oh, it could be a male and male or female and female. Uh, but that's a challenge to a cultural norm that, that's there, and it goes back to a, to the worldview, these presuppositions, and where Christianity has given a worldview, it's a, it's you know going against some of that, and that that makes people uncomfortable, and they question it, or they they want to validate it because that's what they prefer. Uh, integrates uh, the culture because by having a shared worldview, you have more integration. However, when you have challenges and more challenges to worldviews, perspectives then that integration, there, there's not as much integration and you have the challenges that come with that where you, you have people thinking and doing things culturally different based on a different worldview, but that's where it comes into how we as Christians should interact. And we have a whole presentation on that uh, later on, but, uh, but it still go, gets down to the fact, how do we live in this world with the lack of integration sometimes? And uh, we need to uh, look at the biblical perspective that we have been doing uh, and realize that we have to still view everybody created in the image of God, love everyone like Jesus has taught, um, love the Lord your God, greatest commandment, love your neighbor yourself, the second greatest as Jesus put it. Uh, so, but these, uh, the worldview monitors cultural change. So when things change in culture, the worldview acts as, wow, that going against my presuppositions of what I thought things were about. And then uh, it, it provides psychological reassurance as well. And so these are the important aspects of it. All right, so this is kind of a uh, visual uh, to help us understand. When you're born, you're born into a, a particular culture and you experience that culture now. Like my kids were born into the Kenyan culture, not American culture, like I was, but I was by age five, I was living in Morocco. Uh, so I experienced American culture, but then I experienced uh, North African culture. And then uh, by age seven, I was in Europe and uh, France and I was experiencing that culture. So depending on your background, your experiences will uh, differ, uh, but it's within uh, these experiences that you develop your worldview. And this is where that definition of cognitive, evaluative, and effective come in, and why I prefer that. And because it, cognitive is aspect of your thinking, you know, your, uh, your rational aspects of your mind, and. Uh, so as you're living in the culture, you're making decisions about uh, life uh, and uh, what you believe and what you wanna do. Um, those are uh, cognitive aspects and your thinking is influenced by that. Now, the evaluative has to do with what you're deciding on, what's right, what's wrong, 
what's important, what's not important, those type of things. That's your evaluative aspect and where you develop your values. Uh, the effective is the one that's a little vaguer to most people, but it has to do with what you like, what you think is beautiful, uh, or uh, what kind of music sounds good to you, uh, that kind of thing. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about effective. And cultures have different criteria for what looks beautiful. Uh, and uh, in uh, some African cultures, they, they scar their faces and other parts of their body. And uh, these are beauty scarrings. Now, we tend not to do that in the, U the U.S., uh, but we do see a lot of piercing more these days and tattoos. And that's, you know, most people who do that consider it uh, to be beauty. Uh, but out of this comes the, your worldview. That, that's your presuppositions there. And from all of that, you make your decisions. So if you're thinking about what's beautiful, you may dress in a certain way that's what you think is beautiful. Or for girls put on makeup, for guys do their hair a certain way. Uh, but you also make value decisions on what's right, what's wrong, how you behave on all that. And uh, from your thinking, you'll produce behaviors and products. And that goes into the current culture. So it just comes back into the input of the culture. And, uh, but this is one of the areas we need to take, be mindful of. In the midst of this, God has always worked in culture, like we talked about earlier, uh, God and culture. And he's always been above, but through culture and working, and he's revealed his will to us in his word through prophets and apostles and so forth. But mostly, but finally in Christ who came and lived in this world. So in a specific culture and a minority group within the culture uh, being suppressed by the Roman government, which was uh, uh, in charge of everything at that time. And we have God's revealed word for us. So it enters into the mix and helps us to make sense of our culture. And it, it comes within our cognitive thinking. And since we're created in the image of God, I put a little one here, uh, right here, saying, note that we're created in the image of God and he gave us, uh, he said, you're in charge of this creation I've given you and you're created in my image. And in some sense, we're built with a sense of something above ourselves, I think. And so I have that aspect in there as well. And it's built into our who we are. And uh, that's why, as we've talked about religion, and that humans are just notoriously religious. And I think it's built into who, who we are, that we, we, in some sense, even if we don't believe it, there's a sense that there is a spiritual dimension to us and to the world we live in. And so this, I hope, gives kind of a model for understanding uh, uh, worldview and its uh, relationship to culture. All right, exercise. Uh, we're gonna end with uh, uh, two uh, exercises. And uh, uh, for the second one, you certainly can have a piece of paper uh, ready. Uh, but uh, for this one, I know yeah, if you think about uh, as you've gone through school, they get, school they're giving you these tests. And one of the tests uh, is which one doesn't belong kind of test. And, uh, and especially when you were younger in school, they would give you that. Uh, and one of the questions was, well, you have these four things, uh, which are related, but which one of them doesn't belong with the other three? And uh, for example, this one, three adults, one child. What doesn't belong? Uh, based on that one, we would generally say the child doesn't belong. And that would be correct. And if you're doing one of those tests, that's probably what you want to do. Uh, now, uh, on this one, you got three wheels and a pair of pliers. Okay. Well, you know, the way the test is saying, they're trying to get you to think in certain categories. So, well, you got wheel category and you got tool category. So, the tool doesn't belong with the other three, and that would be correct by those that testing. Or right, here's one. Uh, okay, you got three tools and some firewood. Uh, and uh, so, so which one doesn't belong? Everybody would say, oh, the firewood doesn't belong, it's not a tool. And again, that would be correct on one of those. 
or you can do this. You got three hats and a shirt. Well, you got a hat category of clothes and a shirt category of clothes. So we would just say the shirt doesn't belong. Now, the, this is a typical way of doing some testing in the US. However, if you do this testing, for example, I'll use where I lived in Africa. If you were to give this test, you they would and say, okay, three adults, one child, which one doesn't belong? They would not say the child. Uh, they would uh, say one of the adults. And you would go, what? That, that's not the way I think. Uh, because we've been trained to think a certain way in the West. Uh, and you say, well, why is that? And they say, well, you need a husband and a wife and to have children. And so it makes sense to, that you, you really need, don't need the extra adult because you need a man and a woman and, and, that's, and they take care of the child. They think in a functional term instead of categories. So you might figure out what's gonna happen when you get to the wheels and the wrench. They'll go, oh, don't need one of the wheels. You only need two wheels for a cart to carry the stuff to the market. And then the wrench, you need it in case one something breaks down with the wheel. Functional, not by, based on just dropping them in categories. Same thing happens with the tools and the firewood. They will look at that and go, oh, well, you obviously you don't need the hammer because you actually need could use a saw or the ax to, to cut firewood and you need firewood for cooking. And uh, so the hammer's not much use. Again, functional. And same with the last. They would go, oh, I'll just get rid of one of the hats. You don't need three hats, uh, you know, and it'd be better to have a shirt than an extra hat. And functional. But we've been taught to think in the uh, say, okay, categories recognize the difference in categories. So that's a bit different. All right, last uh, thing we're gonna talk is do this last exercise. Here are five uh, patterns of dots. And uh, this is a lot easier to do in class than it is online, uh, but you can, you can do it. And uh, what I usually say is just, makes the same pattern of dots on a piece of scratch paper. And out of those dots, um, make a design, you know? And uh, from those, uh, and we'll look at those designs and see, see what you've done. And so ideally at this point, what you want to do is get scratch paper, make several of these, uh, about three of these and go, okay, what design can I make out of those? And so uh, if you want to take the time to do that, you can do that now and uh, pause this uh, video and just do it and then start it up uh, again uh, for the last slide we're going to show you. And then this will be the end of this presentation. All right. So if you've done that, now we're going to move on to that. I ask you to make a design using these uh pattern of dots. All right. Well, generally, if you if people do this, what I find is that the first one almost everybody makes is the star, which you obviously you look and say, okay, that's, that's it. Okay. Now, uh, another one that a lot of people make are this one. Yeah, there's are something similar to it. Uh, again, or maybe uh, this one, less people make it. They don't seem to, they tend to make straight lines more, uh, so they don't make the round, but it does uh, use the dots appropriately and everything. Uh, now, here's the one that I have yet to have anybody in class do. And uh, that's this one. All right. Now, the difference between this one and the others and generally any other design that most students make in class that I've had over the years, and I've had a good number of students have done this exercise, uh, none of them have done the last one. And, uh, but almost all of them, the one thing they all have in common is they try to connect the dots. They always draw lines to connect dots and generally straight lines, except in the few cases where some people have done the, this round one over here, but nobody has done this one. Now, remember I said, you know, using the dots, make a design. I did not say to connect the dots, but yet class after class after class, people connect the dots. And the reason is that from, you know, 
preschool on, it's, it's taught us whether intentionally or not, oftentimes intentionally, is connecting dots and drawing straight lines between dots and so forth and so on. And, you know, if you do not think you are being influenced by your culture, your education system, uh, this one should convince you otherwise. We are thought to think in certain ways and certain patterns. And that not only includes drawing lines, but also in our values and uh, how we think of the world and uh, you know what decisions we should make and uh, so forth. Our popular culture is very powerful. Uh, you know, news media is uh, quite powerful. Uh, and uh, our education system uh, is powerful. Uh, but we have to realize that uh, uh, there are different ways of looking at things. And uh, this last one here that was made, if you did this same assignment uh, in India, and uh, one of my professors who did, and uh, he said, this is the one that they do mostly in India, that last one, because they're, 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 they think in a different way. And uh, they're, they're not trained to think like we are in the West in a lot of, a lot of times. And so realize the point of this is to say, we're being affected all the time by the culture around us. And we need to get to our worldview, and especially as a Christian worldview, to realize that it will come in uh, to conflict with other perspectives. And uh, we have to realize, too, that things are pushing on us to conform to certain things, which may be okay, or which may not be okay. All right, well, that's uh, the exercise and the end of uh, the first of three uh, for this uh, week. Uh, and uh, we will continue with the second. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll be continuing the recording of those and uh, get those posted. So take care. See you at the next video.